Welcome, everyone. Uh, we're ready to start with the next session. We will have Chloe presenting on uh, the Internet's autoimmune system. So Chloe, amongst other things, which she will discuss a bit further uh, during her presentation, is security researcher advocate at Buck Crown. So please uh, join me in welcoming Chloe. All right, good morning, everyone. Let me just say this mata are, is delicious. Um, <laughs> all right, let's get started. So we're gonna just kind of dive into the current landscape of Canadian laws. That's right, I studied Canadian laws for 48 hours. So now I think I know it more than the US laws when it comes to the hacking community. Um, then we're gonna dive into what's needed, um, a little bit about Safe Harbor and Disclose I.O. and all hands in, and I do have these beautiful stickers if you want some afterwards. All right. Just want to say, once again, this is not legal advice. I am not a lawyer, not in the US, not in Canada. I did try to go to law school. I wanted to be that human rights attorney. And then I realized that might be tricky. So I didn't go. So a little bit about myself. I'm a security researcher advocate at Bug Crowd. Who has heard of Bug Crowd? Raise your hand. Excellent. Lovely. How many of you guys do Bug Bounty as a program manager? Raise your hand. Cool, okay. How many of you guys are hackers and have done bug bounty? Raise your hand. This is nice. All right, great. Um, I also head women in security, WOSEC. I'm also the chapter head of San Francisco Bay Area. And yes, we have chapters all over the world. So ladies, if you want to create a woman in security, talk to me afterwards. I'll help you out. Um, when I'm not doing work, I do mentoring for InfoSec for keeping women in the field um, in every possible way. I do do speaking on diversity and inclusion, bug bounty, and safe harbor, which you'll see today. Um, I am a board member of four nonprofits. I also founded a nonprofit called Drop Labels. And last but not least, I just released Women Who Hack, a very slack workplace. So any ladies that are hackers, let me know you'll be invited. All right, let's dive into this. So this is gonna be scary, I know, but I promise I'll try to make it as nice as possible. Who here has heard of Kelly Dunham? Anyone, this case? All right, so Kelly Dunham basically came across 285 personal accounts, and this is family services. So that means kids' information, parents' information, where they live and whatnot. She decided to go and contact Family Services about it, and they never responded, never got back to her. And one and a half months later, because she was just like, my personal info is out there, my kid's personal info is out there, this something needs to be done. So she posted on a private Facebook group with the hyperlink of the PDF. And right away, of course, someone contacted Family Services about it, and now they're facing a giant case like lawsuit, but the other thing you should note is that whenever you go against a big organization, guess what happens? They come after you too. So now she is facing criminal charges, and right now it's an unknown decision at this time. So right now, there is, I wanna focus on Copyright Act and the criminal code. Once again, I'm not an attorney, so don't take this advice all the way, but just giving you some information. So Copyright Act is broken down into two parts. Consent. You got consent from the owner itself that you are okay to do hacking on a certain thing, so something that's in scope. Also, if you want to disclose something, you have to give a reasonable notification. Now, that sounds really easy, right, and simple. However, sometimes it could be a very different situation because sometimes you need to find not just a copyright holder, but maybe it's actually the network operator. For example, if you are pen testing on site A, guess what? Maybe Microsoft server has the issue. So you can't just disclose only to someone at support for website A, you actually have to also talk to the Microsoft server contact because that is the copyright owner. So trying to figure out who to contact is ambiguous, first of all. The other thing is you could definitely run into an issue, a legal situation. And last but not least, 
Reasonable notification in Canada is very interesting. There's no actual timeline. So say if you do contact them and they don't respond right away, it doesn't necessarily mean you gave reasonable notification. So reasonable notification is something very ambiguous once again. But also, there's a little cause in there. And what it says is that directly that if it is in the public interest good for you to disclose publicly before going to them, that is acceptable. Now, the thing is, how do you figure out which one is correct and which one is not? So now, this is important. So what the two takeaways of the Copyright Act I want you to know is it's very ambiguous, it's very broad, and it definitely can lead security researchers in good faith to end into a lawsuit. But most importantly, the public disclosure versus notifying the time frame, that's also up in the air regardless. It is a catch-22 situation in many ways. Criminal code. So criminal code is when you decide to do some ethical hacking and maybe you stumbled upon a vulnerability that was out of scope. It happens, right? And during this time, um, you could be prosecuted, believe it or not, because you went out of scope even though you stumbled upon it. This is another issue. So always asking for permission ahead of time is a given, but sometimes you run into situations where you didn't know to do that and you don't know who to contact, which can be a very troubling situation because even if you accidentally find or someone to personal data, then what happens is that it can lead you into a possible prosecution situation. But don't worry, you're not the only ones that are freaking out as hackers. Believe it or not, program managers are scared too when they do bug bounty because they're opening basically the space to be like, hack on us. But please respect our in scope versus out scope. And what happens is that they do need you. Believe it or not, there are so many situations where we need, as hackers itself, to be that everyday hero. We find vulnerabilities, we wanna keep our neighbors safe, so how do we do this in a way? But also, how do we get the program managers to commit with us as well? Because they're scared at night too, believe it or not. So I know that was a little scary. Um, so here are some puppies, and I did put one cat in there for any cat lovers. I have a dog, so I'm a dog lover, so I did try to be inclusive here. Anyway, so what do we need right now? Perhaps better sleep, right? Or better communication, standardized language. Maybe another Red Bull, I highly suggest doing sugar-free so you don't get that sugar crash. But what really do we need? We need standardized, easy, readable, safe, harbor language. So then we can keep this bilateral um, mechanism to try to keep each other safe, especially our loved ones when it comes to our personal info. Also, how do we reduce ambiguity? Because it's not just in Canada that has this issue, US has it too. So how do we go about this and increase visibility for security research programs to include explicit safe harbor status? I give you Disclose I.O. Who here has heard Disclose I.O.? Raise your hand. Wow, okay, this is great. You guys are gonna get some info about Disclose I.O. Um, so Disclose I.O. is basically broken into two parts. So one is the standardized vulnerability disclosure language that companies can adopt and put it onto their website. And then there's another part which is the list, which is the hacker's list, in my opinion. So what I wanna do is when I want to see whether or not if I wanna do a vulnerability submission or whatnot, I'll look on this list and I'll be like, okay, what companies are practicing Safe Harbor? Because I'm gonna feel a little bit safer if I'm disclosing a vulnerability. This list is amazing for that, and I'll show you reasons why it's even better than what I just shared with you. So Disclose.io, what it is, is a framework for both companies and researchers to participate equally together to try to keep it safe environment while keeping the entire world safe. And the framework is designed to balance. So the most important thing is the readability. A lot of times we have researchers that are all over the world and maybe English is not their first language. So sometimes they'll be looking at the legal terms when they're submitting a bug and what happens is that they didn't read what was in scope or out of scope or how many of you guys have an Apple product and it's like terms and conditions. How many of you guys actually read that entire thing every time? 
Exactly. So not only are English second language speakers having issues figuring out what does this jargon mean, but also ourselves, we don't want to go over these terms and conditions sometimes. So it's very, very important that we keep everyone in a way that everyone understands and appreciates the language and also can practice safe harbor safely. And this also, Disclose.io works with attorneys around the world, safe harbor for researchers, so researchers participate, and also for program owners. So the requirements to participate if you are a program manager. Most importantly, you gotta say what is the scope? What is the scope? And be very explicit in the scope because you don't want people to do out of scope. So being more explicit is gonna be very important. Next is rewards. You know, let us know. Do you want, will you give us swag? Will you pay us? These are things that a lot of security researchers want to know. Also, official communication channels. I don't know about you guys, but sometimes it takes hours to find a contact email, and sometimes it could take days. And at that point, sometimes that vulnerability gets exploited, and that's a situation. So having a very official communication channel is going to be very important. And last but not least, participating in the disclosure policy. I could just read this list, but I feel like you guys could read it yourself. But basically, there are three different types of disclosures that we do work with, and you would have to also note that. So once again, the language itself, believe it or not, it's already part of Disclose.io, so you could actually copy and paste if you want to practice a safe harbor. Now, there are expectations. So if you are a program manager, you need to extend Safe Harbor for your vulnerability research that is related to this policy. That means you will participate in Safe Harbor. The next thing is you will work in a timely manner. That means sometimes people will be like, I found this submission, and you don't respond like three months later. That's not, that's not going to work. So you have to be timely and effective, too. And having that good communication is how you practice bilateral Safe Harbor, too. Make sure to remediate, discover vulnerabilities in a timely manner. Just again, time is at an essence and making sure that is working. You've got to be able to have that good communication between the researcher and yourself. So ground rules. Now, hackers in this room, if you do participate on a safe harbor company, just note that you need to report any vulnerability you discover promptly. Also, avoid violating any privacy of others. Um, and I think if I just keep going, I could say that. But the most important thing is please do not engage in extortion. I've seen this happen too many times. And sometimes they don't mean to do extortion. They just are like, why won't you contact me? If you don't, I will post this. I will let Krebs know. Like, that's not going to do very much well for you in the end. So safe harbor language in the US. So Disclose.io is a US-based. However, at this time, we are working with some Canadian attorneys as well, so then Canadian companies can actually participate as well with Disclose.io. So once that is posted, that's going to be really cool. But other than that, Disclose.io was literally created because of the, safe, the lack of having safe harbor in the U.S. and being able to figure out the laws around it. So it's, it's one of those things that it's going to take some time for Canada, but Probably in the next few months, we will have it rolling out. So now the big question is, how can you participate? So I mentioned if you are someone in the legal field, any attorneys in this room? Sort of. I love that. So if you know any attorneys that would probably want to participate, that would be wonderful, because this is a grassroots movement. It is a community-run movement. That means it is the program managers that are like, I want to support Safe Harbor. It is the researchers who are like, I want to practice Safe Harbor. And here, I'm going to give you the following companies that are practicing it. So everything has been created from the hacker community. And also, any attorneys, there's one possible one. We're also looking for attorneys to always help out. So once again, there's two parts. So there's the safe harbor language that we'll have for Canada very soon. But this is an idea that you get in the US. So basically, if you want to practice, you contact us. And then from there, we help you get everything going and started and running beautifully. 
And then we have the second part, which is the list. It's a directory for hackers. So once again, you see there, there's this beautiful thing of like who to contact, which is fantastic. Um, but it also tells you about swag, money, and what not to expect. Also the policy URL of this is what Safe Harbor is, this is what's in scope, this is what's out of scope. And last but not least, the really important thing about all of this is that it has been formed and created by the hacker community. So program managers, you can participate too, but hackers have also been being like, this company practices Safe Harbor, this one does partial, and this one, it's uncertain. So this is really good for hackers to know ahead of time, like, what you should expect when talking to these people. And the list is always posted. Um, I wanted to make this short for a reason, and the reason for that is because in case people have a lot of questions, but also because I have Disclose I.O. stickers. And I've also been trained to also give this talk in five minutes now. So um, any questions about Disclose I.O. or Safe Harbor or Canadian laws that I may be